just to start, um, and we've already alluded to this a little bit, you know, there, there's a lot that I think we have in common, Mary, uh, which is, I think, in part why we're inviting you is, is because we really think there's some resonance between our ministry and um, who you are as a person and also a lot of the things you write about. Uh, certainly, uh, our ministry is, is about recovery, and I know that's in your background as well, spirituality, particularly Ignatian spirituality, and storytelling. Um, that's really what, what fundamentally, at the end of the day, that our ministry is about is, is people telling sacred stories and sharing those. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and begin. And um, the first question I'd just love to invite you to respond to, Mary, and, and then I'll invite Kathy and Dorothy as well, um, is really about our mission statement. And in our mission statement, we say that, that we invite people to encounter God's love, hope, and healing. Um, so the question for you is just, where have you recently, recently been invited to encounter God's love, hope, or healing in your own lived experiences? Wow. Thanks, Matt. Um, what's so funny, when I first got sober, I was the most ungrateful ho on the planet. Maybe I shouldn't say that. I was the most ungrateful human on the planet. And um, uh, even though I had enormous advantages, so uh, I think I was very lucky uh, that I didn't die while I was drinking and using drugs. And, uh, and I certainly had no spiritual or religious anything when I came, when I, you know, started out trying to get off stuff, but where have I encountered it lately? Well, I had, um, um, where do I encounter it? You know, I can always gauge my spiritual condition by taking, uh, public transportation. I don't know about you guys, but I can wake up in the morning and pray these very, you know, serious prayers. And then as soon as another human being crosses my path, I wish I had a machine gun because there's something wrong with me. Or I grew up in a house with alcohol and firearms. So I have that groove in my, in my brain. Um, I, I have a tendency when, in, and I encounter unhoused human beings to talk to them. Um, and I was recently in San Diego where there's a big population of people who don't have anywhere to live. And I was with people who were afraid of them. And I said, really, you know, I'm, a, <laughs> I'm afraid of the guy with the AK 47. These people look fine. They, nobody's armed. They seem fine. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and there was there were a couple of people that I found uh, very moving. One was a guy who was was screaming outside of drugstore. I was going into murder or suicide, murder or suicide, and I started to walk past him. And I turned around and I said, "Excuse me, sir, isn't there like another option than those two things?" Mm -hmm. And he was like. You're right. And it's just a, it was a perfect small moment. Um, the other thing was on an airplane I took, there was a, somebody I conceived a towering resentment for. Um, I have a bad immune system. I ba my daughter-in-law is a nurse. I babysit uh, my grandchildren. And there was a guy on the, on the airplane really snotty and coughing and sucking his thumb. Mm. And I immediately start making up a story in my head about the person, about who he is and how, and can, how he's ruining my life. And uh, it's funny. I just took a moment and said, a, just said a quick bites Lent. And my, what I'm doing for Lent is to try to help the hurt. I'm just want to help people who are hurt. Mm -hmm. And I, I said my prayer and then I thought, why would I resent somebody who needs to suck his thumb? Like, what is it my business? Mm -hmm. um, like, you know, there are times I wish I could suck my thumb. <laughs> you know, why do, <laughs> why do I have to, you know, nobody made me the boss of anything. And in terms of comportment, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, can be psycho at the drop of a hat. Uh, 
but also I think obviously with my, uh, the people I work with getting sober and, uh, one young woman who almost died three years ago when she came in, had a heart attack at like 30 years old, uh, using cocaine and, um, is up for a big job, published a book and is up for a big job as a professor that I imagine she's going to get. Um, but just the turnaround in her life. Uh, and it's so funny when I met her, I just thought she hated me Mm -hmm. and, but somehow made this connection with her and she's been to stay with me and just her friendship is really important in my life. So it's really kind of everywhere. I think it's, it's with the people I see on the street. It's, it's people in my family. My, my uh, granddaughter was very sick for a week and my daughter-in-law is a nurse and my son's working and I was able to take care of her. And she so regressed and was, she's a three-nager, you know, but Mm -hmm. that sense of tenderness and connection we had came back, you know, now she's bossing me around and telling me how to do my hair, but, uh, (laughs) as of of this morning, but, um, I think, uh, for me, it's just the, it's a practice for me, I guess people imagine you decide to believe in God, or I got baptized when I was 40. You do, and then you're just like, you believe in God every second of your life. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe a saint does that, but not me. So I, I just <laughs> look at, I practice looking. And I had an old Jesuit ask me one time, the, the first guy I did the Ignatian exercises with, and I was having a really hard time writing about my own addiction. And I was embarrassed at what a bad mother I was. And and uh, my son was three. And, and I remember him saying to me, where is God in this? Mm-hmm. And if you don't yet believe in God, it's just like, where is the love? Where is the light sure. uh, in this? And it's such a, so often when I'm in a dark place, there's almost always somebody there I can talk to now at this point in my life. And Mm -hmm. God sometimes calls me on the telephone Mm -hmm. and God sometimes gives me a seat on the subway Mm -hmm. and God, someone sees me somewhere and says, Oh, are you cold? Should I close this window? Mm -hmm. Sometimes Mm -hmm. it's just those small things um, that I decide are God. So that's beautiful. Thank you. Kathy, what about you? Where have you been invited to encounter God recently or love or hope or healing? Right. So, um, wow, Mary has just brought us to so many different lovely places. <laughs> I had one place I was going to start, but, um, I think, I think the thing about, um, being invited to, you know, to experience God's love is you have to be in that place where you're, you're really, um, open to it, ready, ready for it, searching for it. Um, you know, for me, the, I've had, two kind of big periods in my life. But um, as Mary spoke about how she works with young mothers, it was when I was a young-ish mother because I had my kids later. Um, But, you know, had three small children, had, um, you know, a husband who was an active alcoholic, um, in and out of work. Um, My mother had just been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Um, I have a disabled brother. So kind of all the curveballs, you know, thrown all Mm. at once, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And I think I was just like looking for, you know, what's this, there's got to be more than, than, you know, than this picture that I'm in, Um, you know, it paralleled with an earlier period in my life where I also said there's got to be more. So I think I was just ready. Um, My, my parish community has a wonderful, you know, retreat process um, where, you know, it's witness based and um, it's very much, very much like what we do you know, in, Ign- in ISP, Ignatian Spirituality, where we, we share faith, um, we mm-hmm. share our stories. Um, and, uh, you know, it helped me to move on and tell my story and um, be part of a community where this is a normal way of living. Um, I mean, my idea of a good Saturday night is sitting on a couch with a friend, um, mm-hmm. with, depending upon the night, a cup of tea, glass of wine, um, and talking about where God is in our life. I mean, that's, mm-hmm. those are the friendships that developed from that period. 
um, that continue to this day. Um, and, you know, do I fall all the time off that, you know, off that path? Yes. Um, the thing that I read this morning that just really centered me, I was happy for that centering this morning was, you know, Jesus was tempted with, you know, are, if you're the son of God. And, you know, for me, it's like, if I'm a child of God, and for me, it's always, I don't have arrogance. I have unworthiness. Like I'm, if, Mm -hmm. if I'm worthy of God's love. Um, Mm -hmm. So that's the thing that I'm always like trying to keep myself on the path of and, and doing so by surrounding myself in community, because um, I grew up with a lot of uh, violence, terror, fear, um, and um, it was all in isolation. We were always taught, mm-hmm. you know, I came from this very, grew up in New York City, Irish Catholic family, always put on a good face, hide your dirty laundry, sweep everything under the rug, and put on this persona, go out into that world mm-hmm. and be um, someone who you're really not. So it almost taught mm-hmm. the opposite of what, what I've tried to, um, to learn in these later years. Um, so... Um, this experience of being shown Jesus, you know, that was, you know, having this connection, this, this person to go to, um, you know, this love, this connection, it's, it's been a lifeline. It's, it's framed, uh, the past 15 years of my life and now kind of being, um, part of ISP. And I've almost moved on from the retreats of my past because the stories that I hear, addiction is a huge part of my life, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. So the stories that I hear from Dorothy and so many others um, have opened me up to the traumas of my childhood. Um, So I, you know, uh, it's just, you know, it's, it's just opened up the healing, you know, in new and profound ways. Yeah. Thanks, Kathy. You speak um, a little bit about powerlessness and, and Mary, um, your writing, your interviews, speaking engagements, I've heard you allude to powerlessness as well, or experience of powerlessness, both as a child and as an adult. Um, and, and really for both of you, it sounds like these are deeply formative experiences. Um, and so my question is, is, could you say a little bit more about experiences of powerlessness um, and how you've grown through them or what they've taught you um, about your own journey? Thank you. That, what a great question. And thank you so much for that, for sharing that stuff. You know, so I heard somewhere, I can't remember who said it, you know, everybody wants to be brave. Nobody wants to be vulnerable. Mm-hmm. But unless you're vulnerable, you can't be a hero. And I also find, and I think this was true at the end of my drinking, which was the end of my marriage, the end of kind of my whole life as I conceived it. Um, And you always have to have three days in hell, you know, before there's a resurrection. I don't know why, but there, there is, I think I was such a non-believer when I first started to pray that I used to pray shooting the finger at the light fixture. You know, I was just, if there was any God, I was just mad about it. Like mm-hmm. I was just mad um, mm-hmm. that uh, I don't know that I got in the wrong line or something. But um, but I, I, I think when you're really hurt like that, when you're really powerless, I my sister died um, two years ago during early COVID, two and a half. And she was my hero when we were growing up and we were estranged the last seven years before she died. And I'm writing about learning that she was going to die. She died in like a week and I only knew she was sick for two days. Wow. And um, we only had one mutual friend who was close to both of us. Her, Her son, her only son, she has one son. I have one son. She had a lot of stepkids. Um, But uh, I had been estranged from him for seven years. And when I heard, I'm writing about hearing about her illness, and I felt like I had been kicked in the chest by a mule. Mm. And uh, I was so devastated. 
And there had also been a big, you know, in families, there was a big kerfluffle from her husband and stepkids and son uh, not to tell me that she was ill. And then a mutual friend of mine and this person who was in touch with her uh, had a long, like hours long conversation about why he, I had to be told. Mm-hmm. And of course, when I heard, I was furious. I was, I was in a, I was grieving. I was sobbing and sobbing, just ugly snot crying. I was on my knees and uh, sobbing. And I instantly conceived this resentment for this person. Again, I'm, you know, I grew up in a, with a lot of conflict and conflict is easy for me. And Mm -hmm. I was on the phone with the friend and I said, how did you get Chris to let you tell me? And he said, well, I finally said to him, she has a spiritual right to pray for her dying sister. And the young man said, that's right. How are we going to tell her? Mm. And then when the guy, my young friend, Phil, whom I know through recovery and also happened to have been my student, my graduate student, um, called me. He talked to me like you would talk to a horse. (laughs) He talked to me so gently. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he reminded me of was that quote, I just said, you know, where is God in this? And I said, there's no Mm -hmm. God in this. She was 67 years old. She died in a week. Uh, yeah. you know, and I have an only son. I, her son had just flown there from Paris and I was just railing. And the day she died, the son called me the moment she died and said, mom died five minutes ago and you're the wow. first person I'm calling. Mm-hmm. And I just said, I was trying not to cry. I said, I'm so sorry. I'm just so sorry what a mess we are and that you we haven't been in touch. And he said, well, I just want you to know that I know you never did on anything on purpose to hurt mom. And I said, well, you mm-hmm. and I both know that's a lie. But it's mm-hmm. especially sweet lie for you to tell me the day she died. Mm. And he's 40 years old and he's called me every day since for two and a half years. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you had told me that kid would ever call me every day or that we would forge this bond, I just got back from, he's a conductor. I got back from seeing him conduct in California. I'm going to Paris to see him conduct this summer. If you had told me how writing this book that I can write this book now with his connection and him talking to me, I mean, that's so different than not having anybody alive. I can run through, you know, is this right? Is this, am I seeing Mm -hmm, this the right mm -hmm. way or to talk to about it? So, um, and I felt last summer when I saw him conduct in Paris, I felt her. I felt my dead Mm. sister. I felt her arms around me and her gratitude for my being there for him. Mary, one of the things I wanted to just follow up on is our experiences of powerlessness uh, for you an entry point into transformation, because that seems like what you were kind of pushing at a little bit. And, And maybe not all experiences of powerlessness are that, but could you just say a little bit about the relationship between powerlessness and and transformation as you've understood it or experienced it? Well, I think as deep as the wound is, that's how deep the healing is. Mm -hmm. And I think when you're really wounded and really cut, I was cut. Mm -hmm. I had, I was, I had a gushing wound. My, my sister whom I adored, she was my hero my whole life Mm -hmm. and to not speak from to her for seven years. And then, uh, there was so much drama. And the last time I'd seen her, she had, she tried to hit me with a hairdryer. And I just thought, I can't, I can't anymore. I just can't. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're grown women, you know, and, and uh, I'm sorry, remind me the question. Well, it's, it's just the relationship between powerlessness and 
points of transformation or, 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 or uh, openings? Like, does it open something new for you? I think when you're hurt enough, you, that God comes to you faster. I mm. actually say those foxhole prayers. Mm-hmm. When I first mm-hmm. got sober, I, I had a woman tell me, my sponsor, Joan the Bone, who I've written about, uh, used to say to me, um, why are you praying to stand it and, you know, stay alive? You know, why don't you pray for something you want? And I'm like, you know, I'm raising a kid. I made $9,000 this year. You know, I need some damn money. Mm-hmm. And she said, <laughs> I, she said, well, pray for money. I said, okay. Mm-hmm. And I prayed shooting the finger at the light fixture. And I swear to goodness, three weeks after I started praying for money, I got a call from people I had never met saying they were giving me $30,000 for a prize I'd won that I had never applied for. Oh my gosh. Now, here's the sad part of this story. I prayed for money after that, it never came. <laughs> <laughs> At that time, and Joan the Bone said, well, you must believe now. I said, well, she said, what percentage possibility that those prayers move something in the world? Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't know, 1%, which now Mm -hmm. I would say 70%. But it was a sliver and I think my lack of hope, my real despair, I asked wholeheartedly. I did ask, and I mostly asked for my son because uh, I didn't have any child care and was trying to work. And um, I, I think those foxhole prayers where you're really bent double, I think mm-hmm. those, they, I think God rushes to answer them. Uh, now I'm, you know, all set up. I'm a professor. I own my apartment in New York city and I'm fancy. And, uh, mm-hmm. I don't have to, I, you know, most of my prayers are for other people now because I'm, you know, good to go. Hmm. Well, thanks Mary. Thank um, you. so, so Kathy and, and Dorothy, um, uh, the question I started with, with, with Mary, and it, it really dovetails off of what you shared a little bit earlier too, Kathy is, uh, about experiences of powerlessness. Um, so Kathy, you were just alluding to an experience of, of powerlessness in childhood. And and you also said a little bit of, of, uh, your adult life, you've experienced that in your relationships. Um, so can you say a little bit, um, about how these experiences of powerlessness have helped you grow, um, or what they've taught you? Yeah. Um, I think something I started saying before was that, um, you know, they cause me to, to seek, to, to just, to just know that like, this can't, this isn't, there's something I'm not seeing. There's, you know, there's a truth there that I am not tapping into. Um, and so it causes me to seek. And um, my, my two deepest experiences of Jesus were as a teenager. Um, and in my young, when I had my young children and, you know, was in a difficult marriage. Um, so my darkest days um, I, I think there's something about us where we're, we're more open, we're more needy, we're more vulnerable. Um, and so the door is more open to, um, to witness however God comes into our path. Um, how I have been taught. Um, so I think, you know, certainly through my experience as an adult, um, you know, joining retreats and so forth, um, having that, that luxury, cause it's a luxury to be a part of a faith community and have all this lovely curated information and prayers and, and all of that. Um, um, but I think it taught me, um, you know, first of all, what I can overcome, how, just, just how strong I am and that, you know, um, perhaps I can be, continue to be strong. Um, you know, I always go back to the serenity prayer. What, what, what is mine to do, what I have agency to do and really what I don't have agency to do and what I need to kind of hand over. Um, so, um, and I I think just generally to accept my circumstances, um, you know, so that I can get myself unstuck from wherever it is that I am. 
you know. Um, Dorothy, do you want to jump in on, on, on this question on powerlessness? Like what, what has your own experiences of powerlessness taught you and maybe describing a little bit of the context of that experience as well, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, powerlessness has had me powerless since, um, a young, since I was a young child and, um, you know, of being, you know, um, molested as a young child and growing up with the parents that I had, you know, I was powerless. I was vulnerable and growing up and being addicted to drugs even kept me more powerless. And Mm -hmm. till I went and got the help that I needed, you know, um, I can say, that um i came far um and during that time you know being in the rehab you know i still felt powerless because i didn't really know how to seek god then even Mm. then um and up until now i've realized how i had victory in my life Mm -hmm. um you know um I started writing my book in the, when I was in the rehab and halfway mm-hmm. house. And that had gave me clarity to tell my story, to mm-hmm. give me the, you know, to break the chains that has never been broken through the generations of my family. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I've grown a lot since I've, uh, you know, been with the ISP and, you know, I have learned so much, um, you know, and I have victory in my life. And this, mm-hmm. and I, the victory that I have in my life is that I have a closer relationship with the God of my understanding. Do I have mm-hmm. that has led me to where I'm at today? Mm-hmm. Amen. Let me let me add. Oh, go ahead, Kelly. One thing about powerlessness, and I. I think I connect with Dorothy here. You know, I think I think we are powerless when we don't know our own story. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I alluded to this before. For me, it was just growing up in this immigrant mindset of, you know, you, you, what's important about you is your persona, not really who you are. And and I'm sure my family didn't mean to convey that, but but that's what I that's what I walked away with. Um, you know, I had a mentally unstable father who raged. My brothers were allowed to leave. You know, I wasn't. I had to stay in this situation. Um, I was completely powerless um, and, you know, was never taught to examine that, was taught to Mm -hmm. just kind of move into the world and kind of put that behind you and, you know, embrace the world, um, you know, with uh, with a pretty a pretty smile or whatever it is I was going to take with me. Um, And I think Dorothy, you know, didn't know your story. So um, I think, you know, we, when we can embrace our story, you know, um, embrace, you know, that we are children of God, that we, you know, that that is our value, that, you know, that's Mm -hmm. how we um, move on in our lives and, and hopefully enable others to, that's my goal, enable others to know their story a little bit better. Yeah. Go ahead, Mary, go ahead. You're on mute, but go ahead. Mm -hmm. You know, Dorothy, I really appreciate what you said on a couple of levels, but you used a word I've never heard used Mm. uh, as I'm 34 years sober. I've never heard this word. You said, I have victory. And I I teared up Mm -hmm. when you said that because I was also raped uh, as a child and also, you know, my mother tried to kill me with a knife and blah, blah, blah. Me too. (laughs) Same, same. Maybe we had the same uh, mother. <laughs> why, do they get, why do they give knives to these women? I don't know. But my mother, the ent- and you also talked about breaking the chains, and my mother got sober at 62. Wow. I got sober at 33. My son got sober at 22, and my sister's son got sober at uh, 20. 
Mm-hmm. So, you know, my daddy drank himself to death. And, you know, saying I, you know, we all had to take, it was, it was so hard. We've all, but I really love that you said, and I love what you said, Kathy, about you don't know your own story and the power. Once you do know, and that was the other thing I just wanted to mention one thing. I have met some people at New York Hospital who are doing research and 12-step meetings and how they work. And when you tell your story or listen to somebody else's story, you secrete a hormone called oxytocin, which is what you secrete when you breastfeed. Mm -hmm. And it's, it makes you feel connected. Mm -hmm. And I know y'all have that experience where you meet somebody and you think, I hate her. (laughs) And then she's sitting next to you on the plane and she tells you something tender about herself and you feel so connected Mm -hmm. and that is the feel good hormone. It lowers your adrenaline. It lowers your cortisol. It lo- it's like, it's like natural Valium, but it's natural. Mm-hmm. So when you mm-hmm. said, you know, we don't just hearing your stories, both Kathy and Dorothy, both of y'all today, I feel that, you know, c- coming through loud and clear, that sense of connection. And if you're a drug addict, if you grew up in a house where you had to hide what was going on, if if your mother tried to shoot the guy who delivered the, drove the ice cream truck, you know, if, if, if you grew up in those places, to feel that connection is so lucky. Mm -hmm. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Mary. Let, Let me ask this because, I mean, there's a couple of directions I'd love to go in right now, but the one that's really jumping out to me because all three of you are circling around this, um, is, is meaning making. Um, you know, Mary, you're an author. Uh, you, you, you tell stories uh, about your lived experience, about your life. Um, you develop stories about characters. Um, you know, based on not only your profession, but your, your, your lived experience and what we're talking about, what makes a story sacred? Or, or how do we make meaning out of our stories? Um, if, if, one of those two questions resonate. And then Dorothy, I'd love for you to jump in on that as well, because I know you're writing uh, your, your own story, but, but what makes a story sacred and how do we make meaning out of some of these really difficult experiences that we've lived through? You know, I heard Miss Gwendolyn Brooks, who was a great poet when I was a young poet, I was about 19 years old before she died. And she introduced the great Etheridge night in Chicago at a poetry festival. And she said, Etheridge, come up here and open your mouth. Mm. And I think when you stand up and open your mouth and you tell those things you're afraid to tell Mm -hmm. because you, nobody felt like this. Mm -hmm. And you say the thing you're scared to say, and you think nobody can, you know, I've done a lot of 12 step work and uh, you know, people have told me some stuff. And uh, I've never looked at anybody with anything but compassion. And I'm not that nice. (laughs) (laughs) And so, and so I think, I think every, I I think going to that, when I'm writing my book right now, I get on my knees before I write and I say, help me to tell, tell the truth. Help me to write one true sentence Mm. to not BS myself. And, um, uh, you know, I I think for me, I hear sacred stories every time I go to a meeting, you know, every time I talk to somebody who's having a hard time, doesn't matter who it is, doesn't matter where they are, doesn't matter if they're like me or I'm like them. It's always a, (laughs) you know, I offered, I took a bunch of vegan wraps from a thing. I was handing them out on the subway and I give them, we give one to a guy and he said, what's in it? I said, it's vegan. And he handed it back (laughs) and he held his hand up like he was offended. And he said, I prefer something with an animal in it. (laughs) (laughs) That was Jesus talking to me that day. I'm telling you, I laughed so hard. I said, you are so funny. Thank you for that. Next time I'll bring you an animal. Yeah. That's beautiful. Dorothy, would you mind jumping in and just telling us 
what you feel makes a story sacred or, or comment a little bit about on your experience of writing and in the, the meaning making process? Her pain. Um, my life experience that I just want someday that I um, always um, felt this was one of my callings to do. I remember a few years ago, I started writing and of course the computer that I had got lost or broken or whatever. So I never thought about it, you know, no more. And until I was at that point in my life, my the lowest point of my life, when I was in that rehab and I just felt like I had nobody. I felt like, you know, I was ashamed to even ask God to forgive me. Um, mm -hmm. But until that moment where I got on my knees and I cried and bawled and you know, just asking God to help me, you know, you know, um, I asked him for wisdom, um, courage. I asked him for guidance. I asked him for healing because I was lost. Mm -hmm. I was, um, everybody turned their backs on me. I was in trouble with the law. It was just a lot, you know, where everything was lost except for me. I was still alive. I wasn't dead. So I had a chance to get better, but I had to put forth the effort to get myself better. And the first initial step that I had to do, it was to admit that I was powerless and my life has become unmanageable. And I had to admit to, you know, you know, just asking God for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And from there, um, I just started like writing on a sheets of paper. I still got those sheets of paper too. <laughs> you know, I started just writing on sheets of paper. And when I um, got out of the halfway house, um, one of the ladies said to me, have you wrote your story? You wrote a good story. And I didn't have a job. I didn't have no money. I went to culinary art school and I got my financial aid money. I used all mm -hmm. my financial aid money didn't have any money and I used all of it to get it published. So um, that's, that's <laughs> my, my story of, you know, just that part of me just being in the rehab, like how I was feeling at that moment, at that time, and just feeling the powerlessness, you know, and my mm house, -hmm. I was feeling how my life was being unmanaged, how I mm -hmm. unmanaged my life. Because I didn't know who I was. I didn't know, you know, all my life. Again, like, um, you know, I can relate to Mary Carr and Kathy because, um, you know, my father was an intravenous user. My mom was an alcoholic. My mom died being an alcoholic. My father died of being an intravenous wow. user. My father died of AIDS, you know. Mm -hmm. And even now I have twin brothers. They're doing 15 years in jail. And I, and I reflect that on a lot of stuff and it just makes me stay stronger in my faith with God. Um, and I must say, you know, the ISP, I, you know, I, I work for God now, you mm. know, um, I never say no to God. Thank you, Dorothy. Kathy, do you want to jump in on this and just share a little bit about your own experience of making making meaning sure. in sacred um, stories? Sure. I mean, I've had opportunities over the years in retreat processes and witnessing and so forth. I've, I've not written a book or anything like that. Um, although I can see where, oh my gosh, you just your eyes would be opened up with that process. But I haven't gone there yet. But, um, but anyway, I would say, you know, just... Um, well, Dorothy and I had a lovely chat about this last night, just, um, you know, that you learn to have compassion for your own story um, and, you know, and to, to love your, to, to love yourself, to love, you know, this is the story and, you know, it's been hard and like, you know, if you can have compassion for yourself, then you can have compassion for, you know, anyone in your path. So I think that's one of, one of the big takeaways for me and the pieces of my story that I've written. Um, you know, and the other thing is just, you know, 
the learning, the healing, the, the themes that, that, that uh, come out of it, you know, for me, the big themes are addiction. Um, I grew up with a mentally unstable father. He wasn't an addict, but he might as well have been. I consider myself the child of an addict because mm-hmm. I grew up with that, uh, you know, I have all the behavioral addictions. So I did Al-Anon for years and years because, you know, I'd go for, you know, all the alcoholics in my life, but, you know, then you find out, you know, you too have, have those uh, attach attachments and addictions, um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, learning about, um, you know, all the themes of my life, healing. I mean, um, addiction, patriarchy is a big theme. that's only really like becoming real for me in the past few years, just, mm-hmm. you know, my father would, authority was upheld regardless of the fact that he was uh, harmful to everyone in his path, but Mm. his authority, you know, and that was what it was taught. My brothers were allowed to leave, but I had to, I had Mm -hmm. to endure, tolerate. So that I carried that my whole life, just, you know, patriarchy that I, I have to in some way defer to other people, even though, you know, I've had more education, I've earned more money. I've, you know, over the years than lots of men, you know, than my husband, you know, Mm -hmm. ex-husband. Um, trauma, you know, I didn't even know, couldn't, couldn't even have told you that I experienced trauma as a child, wow. you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so just these themes that, you know, you, you start to piece together and learn to understand, um, uh, you know, and make meaning out of. Yeah. Well, could you say a little bit, Kathy, and, and we can go around and everybody can respond to this, but would you say a little bit about um, how spirituality or your prayer life what role has that played in your process of healing? Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, it's at the, it's at the very center of it. I think that, you know, the first step for me was when I started, you know, in my early forties, you know, joining in, in these retreats and um, just really having an encounter with the divine mm-hmm. um, and just kind of, I think just kind of, understanding that, you know, that I, I had value. I'm a child of God. I think it was that first, just, you know, emboldening of myself and not, not even emboldening, maybe not the right word, but just, you know, that I might not be a hundred percent right about things, but that, you know, I, I have a place and an opinion and a life to plan and, Mm -hmm. you know, let's move forward with it. Um, so I mean, spirituality and, you know, learning to, you know, very much identify feelings and, and follow those. Um, really, really, and you know, there's so much you read about, you know, that, that spirituality, you know, is contemplative, it's quiet, it's listening to the inner voice, and it's all those things. To me, that was step one. But to me, learning, you know, just listening to voices, reading voices, hearing voices that teach me things that were never modeled for me. That mm-hmm. to me is spirituality as well. I mean, mm-hmm. it's um, Sumon Kid who taught me about patriarchy in her book *Dance of the Dissonant Daughters*. It's uh, Bessel van der Kolk who taught me about trauma. Um, mm-hmm. Can't think of the name of his book, but anyway, it's mm-hmm. um, *The Rooms of Al-Anon* and addiction, and you know Richard Rohr breathing underwater. I took his yeah. course. You know, um, so many things. Learning to me, those Patrick Otuma, also a poet, as you know, and also this. I'm very attracted to conflict negotiation. Like he's a, he's a, he was a conflict guy, right? Just, mm-hmm. you know, with all these broken relationships, it's like, those things are like, they're like prayer to me, like scripture. So I'd say the first step for me, you know, is this encounter and this witnessing and, and noticing of myself um, with mm-hmm. the divine and then kind of moving on to, you know, s- hearing the divine and, and the voices that I needed to hear. You know? mm-hmm. God's deepest desire in Ignatian spirituality. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Kathy. Mary or Dorothy, would one you want to jump in on just kind of commenting or, or um, expanding on what uh, Kathy was sharing, which is really about um, how our prayer practices or spirituality has been integral or important to the experience of healing um, in your own lived experience? Um, I want to say that uh, I really, I mean, it's not a day that does not go by where I'm just like 
grateful just to get up in the morning and go to work. Just to mm-hmm. ha- get out of bed, my feet touching the ground. Just being able to go outside and smell the crisp air or the sun, you know, hitting your face or just looking at the trees. You know, in my addiction, I didn't pay attention to that stuff. Mm -hmm. And when um, I'm going to just piggyback a little bit off of Mary when she said, uh, you know, about praying for other people. It helps me when you, it helps me when I pray for other people. It also helps me pray for myself Hmm. because I was, we was talking to Kathy last night and I was telling her how, you know, people stand at the, you know, fast food restaurants begging for money. And, you know, and I say, wow, it helps me reflect back to, I was near there, almost there. And I can go back very easily. So I have to be, keep on asking God to make my heart humble, make my spirit comfortable, you know, with, with myself. Cause you know, we can get arrogant. We can forget. I don't never want to forget. I don't Mm -hmm. never want to forget the trauma I've been through, the trauma I took my children through, the the life that I led, and um, I don't, I just don't want to never forget. So I pray about that deeply. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Thank you, and thank you, Kathy. You know, I I want to talk about something that it's not good. You know, Kathleen, you know, it's not Christian to talk about. I want to talk about power. I want to talk about power. Mm -hmm. And, and I think, you know, St. Arrhenius said, you know, that God's greatest joy is a human being fully alive. And Dorothy, when you were saying, you feel the, the sun on your face, you know, that God comes to me in my body. You know, it's the body isn't bad. You know, even if it's done some bad things, it's not bad. And that God comes to me in my body. And I think the miracle for me of starting to pray and starting to face, as you both have, that terrible pain that you were fighting to keep stuff down, keep blanked out. Once I started living out of my feelings, out of how I felt, I noticed things like there were people that I used to go to lunch with because they drank like me. Mm. And once I got sober, I didn't want to see them anymore. Mm -hmm. And when I was in the hospital and I was in the mental institution, who came to see me? Those people from from Alcoholics Anonymous. None of the people Mm -hmm. I drank with came. You know, uh, people, you know, just they do. You you could swing a cat around and not hit one who cared if I lived or died. Mm -hmm. And um, and once you're living out of how you actually feel, I think you're living out of your real self. Mm -hmm. And that has power. Mm -hmm. That has real power, because all of a sudden I'm making decisions based on, I don't want to go to that person's baby shower. I don't mm-hmm. care if she has a baby. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Whatever. She can have her damn baby. I don't want anything to do with it. <laughs> but I, you know, I, I married a man because he looked like something you went at a raffle, like somebody you were supposed to marry. Mm-hmm. But he didn't much like me. <laughs> you know, so, but he seemed like who you were supposed to marry. And then you start we're seeing other people and you Mm -hmm. build a life stone by stone and person by person and day by day out of your real Mm -hmm. self, the self that God made your authentic self that Mm -hmm. has power. Mm -hmm. And when I was interviewing for the job, I hold, hold now, I was so afraid to leave my group, my women's group in Boston that I turned down the job three times. And each time I prayed about it, 
And the first time I turned it down, they came back with more money. And the second time I turned it down, they came back with more money. The third time, by the time they got to the third time, it was like, I don't believe in, you know, that money is everything, but they offered me 30% more money Mm -hmm. than they'd started out offering me. And when the guy called me, I said a quick prayer and I said, yes, I would like to do this job. I thought, yes, I can do this. Mm-hmm. And when I got to the school, the university in Syracuse, the chair of the department said, you're the hardest person to negotiate with I've ever negotiated with. And I said, I wasn't negotiating. God <laughs> was negotiating. <laughs> like you said, Dorothy, yeah. I work for God. If you work for God, mm-hmm. Then you know what to do, you know, nine. And we always say, I don't know what to do. I don't know. And 95% of the time I know exactly what to do. And I don't want to do it a lot of times, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but that acting and for me, prayer reminds me who I really am and who God made me really to be. God didn't make me to be raped. I came across bad people who raped me. Uh Uh God didn't make me to be a drunk. I have certain genetic disposition and I wanted to blot out how, who I was. And I thought that would do it. And it did for a minute. But mm-hmm. so anyway, I just yeah, wanted to say that there's, there's power in prayer, you know, real personal power, because once you're acting out of your authentic self, I would say things. I was at Harvard and I was trying to sound smart because I was a high school dropout and a college dropout. And I would raise my hand and I would say things like, I don't know what that is. And it would turn out nobody else did either. And they Mm -hmm. were faking. They were too scared Mm -hmm. to say they didn't know. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden when I was saying who I really was, that's when everything got better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's humility uh, in saying, I don't know. Uh, There's, there's, and, and, and you're right. Most of the time that we say that, uh, other people also don't know. Um, wow. So last question that I just want to spend just a few minutes on, we don't have much time left, um, is really about companionship. All of you in one way or another have alluded to this idea of companionship, and it's so central to what our ministry is about. Uh, the Ignatian Spirituality Project is really about walking with people. Uh, it's not in front of them. It's not behind them. It's side by side with them. And it's a really integral part of our ministry. It's also a really integral part of recovery. So um, in just the last couple of minutes that we have, uh, could you all just share maybe someone who's walked along uh, your journey with you and what role they've really played um, in, in your life? And maybe they walked with you for years and years and years. Maybe they walked with you for just a couple of weeks but they were really transformative in that. But just some some commentary commentary on companionship, walking with people, uh, and what that experience has been like for for you all. Um, I want to say, um, since I have not been back to Monmouth County, I settled down here, and um, in East Orange, and um. Christy, she's part of the retreat, and she has became a very, very, very important person in my life. I mean, um, this lady, like, you know, I can, whatever I'm going through, I can call her, you know, uh, we go on outings together. I mean, my kid, my grandkids, we go to, you know, her house, um, We just have such a connection. And also Queen was a witness um, on on the first retreat that I went on. And we're friends right to this day. It's just God has put me, he replaced all the bad stuff that was in my life with goodness of goodness of people. Even you, Kathy, you know, we can sit and talk for hours and when me and Kathy get on the phone, we might as well don't have anything to do. <laughs> Cause we get on the phone for hours. We put each other to sleep last night. 
You know, and it just feels good to have new friends, new people that really care about you. And, you know, it's been times when Christy done stuff for me, and I'm like, oh, she's going to come back and want something from me or, you know, but I feel like today I don't have to feel like that. Um, mm -hmm. And I just feel like the ISP team has really walked this journey for me, with mm -hmm. me, sorry. You know, and um, I'm I'm really grateful for this ISP. Um, this you know, just the community, the um, just sharing, you know, God's love, and you know, we you know, hope and our faith, and you know, what stays, what go, what goes on here. What I'm sorry, what is said here stays here. I love that. Um, mm -hmm. it's just a connection. And I, I'm just, I want to be, I, well, actually I'm doing it now, but, you know, just giving hope to the other women who are struggling with addiction. You know, I want to be able to shine a light through them as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dorothy. Appreciate it. Beautiful. Yes. Beautiful. Um, Companions on my journey, um, I would have to say women that I connected with through my early retreat processes who have just become, you know, lifelong friends of faith. Um, and like Dorothy said, people who, you know, the conversation always re revolves around, um, you know, matters of the heart and where, mm -hmm. where God is in our life, where he's leading us, um, where she is leading us. Um, you know, also challenging me on my thinking, which isn't mm -hmm. always uh, spot on, you know, I need to be challenged occasionally. Um, and keeping, you know, always keeping um, me grounded in that, you know, that we are, we are God's children, you know, that we're mm -hmm. all, we're all there and that not to forget it because um, when I fall off that, that's when things go bad. When I don't remember who I am, um, you know, that's when I, I become a worse version of myself. Um, I would have to say, um, you know, I also have walked with a, one of my children through alcoholism as well. Um, you know, and that has just brought a level of honesty and sharing and healing that, um, you know, has been so, you know, meaningful for me in my life. Um, you know, and, and it's helped me not in my non-substance um, addictions, which mm -hmm. are as pesky as, as I think the substance kind, you know, they're lifelong and I'm continually fighting them. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Well, thanks, Scotty. Mary, you get the last word. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> I'm not worthy. <laughs> I don't know. I just, I, I've been sober a long time. I sponsor a lot of women. I've been sponsored, still sponsored. Um, there's no time, uh, that I don't, that there's not somebody I can pick up a phone and call. I was a friend of mine died, uh, four years ago, right before my sister died. And, uh, we were very close. It was a writer. It was Philip Roth is who it was actually. And we mm -hmm. had, we had dinner maybe three nights a week. I would walk across the park and I would go to his house in the summer in Connecticut every other weekend. And when he was dying, there there was another writer, Judith Thurman, who just won a big prize last night. Uh, and she and I met over his deathbed. And, you know, when somebody's passing, it's, you know, there are a lot of people hanging around, but she and I were like, mm -hmm. and, um, she, uh, she has just been like a sister to me. And I also wanted to say, I'm accompanied by the dead. Oh, wow. I'm, I'm accompanied by my dead sister. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a couple of years ago, a guy grabbed my private zone <laughs> on the street in New York, walked up to me on ninth Avenue. It's I'm just with sunny day, da, 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 grabbed me in my secret place. And I chased him to the Port Authority on the phone with the law. Hmm. That was my sister. 
that was my sister. She knew how to fight. And, uh, and there was a, there was an unhoused person on the street. He said, when the guy grabbed me, I followed him into the sandwich shop. And I said, not today. Uh, uh-uh, not me, not today. Mm-hmm. And the guy just go, is getting his sandwich, like whatever, you know? And then I got a little scared and I backed up and there was a guy sitting on the street on some cardboard. And he said, what, what did he do to you? I said, he grabbed, I didn't know what to say. My private zone is what they call it in the day, my granddaughter's daycare. They, he grabbed my private zone and he said, he can't do that. And I said, I know. And so then he walks out and he starts, takes off running. Well, I ran right behind him on the phone with NYPD, ran mm-hmm. all the way to the Port Authority about three blocks. They arrested him, him saying, I didn't do anything. I said, he grabbed me and I want him arrested and I'm going to like, and that was my sister where I got the mm-hmm. guts or the craziness to do that. And the woman said to me, the cop, who one of the one of them was a woman. She said, do you need counseling? I said, miss, I said, I've had enough counseling that I chased him three blocks. I don't need any counseling. I know who the asshole is here. It ain't me. It ain't me. And if he's doing that to me on this street, what's he doing to these cute little young yeah. women with their, with their tatas hanging out? I see that. No, this guy needs to go to jail. And um, so in a strange way, I feel her and I have a relationship with her from reconnecting with her son that is better than the one we were able to have when, when she was on this side of the grass. Mm -hmm. So I feel really lucky Mm -hmm. and Jesus and the angels and saints. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I tell people all the time, I think they like me best. I do. Well, that's a really powerful story. Thank you so much, Mary. Thank you, Dorothy. Thank you, Kathy, for your time uh, today and really sharing sacred stories. I mean, all of you in in responding to the questions I asked, you're really sharing sacred stories from your own lived experience, which is really fundamentally what our ministry is about. And that when we share these stories, uh, not only are we inviting one another in, but we're inviting our higher power in. And that's where transformation and healing can start to begin uh, so that we can kind of walk out uh, into our lives a, a new person. So really, thank you so, so, so much. Sincerely appreciate it and very grateful to share the conversation with the three. Thank of you, us. Matt. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> thank you, Matt. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Dorothy. <laughs> Pleasure to meet you. Thank you. you.